and Holy Spirit. Well, as the theaters gear up with candidates for the Oscar, Hollywood would probably be very pleased with our gospel today. For not only does it contain the opportunity for special effects, it really is a three-parter. And Hollywood loves three-parters because you get all that money with part one and then all the money with part two, and then all the money with part three, and then there's all the marketing. The first part of today's gospel we are familiar with. We've already heard this story unfold during the Epiphany season. Of course, it's the baptism of Jesus this time. It's being told through the eyes of John the baptizer, the idea that Jesus is the anointed, the chosen one from God. The Holy Spirit has descended on him and he is the Messiah. This part one of the Gospel focuses on the fact that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Savior is a fascinating word. What comes to mind most immediately would be the root word save. But we can go beyond that because the root word of Savior has the same root as another word that we don't often associate with God or religion or the church. And that root comes to the word salvage. Savior and salvage are both based on the same word. Now, what do we think of when we think of salvage? We might think of a salvage company. We might think of recycling. We might think of what we have to take out to the curb uh, once a week. But you know, salvage means so much more. Some of you know that I am a really big Star Trek and Star Wars fan. And I often say that my childhood hero wore a gold pajama top because that's what Captain Kirk looked like back in the 60s. But Captain Kirk's character was based on Horatio Hornblower and the great novels of E.M. Forster, who wrote of that captain of the British Navy during the great time at the, during which the British Navy just ruled the seas of the world. And the concept of salvage in those days meant seeing a ship in distress or imminent danger and taking action to save that ship. And there were very specific salvage laws during the 19th century. And I did some research this week and found out that those laws aren't just 19th century. They go way back to Hellenistic Greece, and that from the earliest of times, when human beings took to the waters, there were laws that governed what happened when that vessel got in danger, and when someone risked their life to save that vessel. They're the ancient maritime salvage code. And it's fascinating because it really hasn't changed. It talks about a fundamental part of our human condition. For if you claim salvage and save a vessel, you are entitled to the equal value of that vessel for yourself because you salvaged it. You salvaged its identity, what it contained, and who was on it. So now, let's take the word salvage and put it in the context of our faith. <coughs> Who saves us? Who salvages us when we are in danger, when we are in trouble in life? I don't know about you, but in my life, I've needed salvaging many times. <laughs> and the one who comes as my salvage person is Jesus Christ with that grace and that forgiveness 
and that inspiration to do better and to move on. And what does the ancient salvage laws tell us about the one who saves and salvages our souls? That person has the equivalent of our life to be asked to give, to, for us to give to that person. Jesus saves us and salvages us from the storms in our world. And Jesus asks our discipleship. Jesus asks of us in a very fundamental and basic manner our being, our worth to give back. That which is given is returned to God. That's part one. Part two of this epic the sequel, if you will, the part of the gospel today that we didn't hear last week is that concept of discipleship I just mentioned. We hear the naming of Peter as the disciple, the going to be, go on to become the rock of the church. This idea that a calling comes to the disciples to follow Jesus in their lives and to commit their lives and their being to him. And the idea that a calling comes to all of us in our lives to commit ourselves to Jesus and all that we are to him. What that means is very different for each person in this congregation and, in, and indeed the world. But what it means also has some things in common. And one of those common themes is that in this new year, in this season of epiphany, where the light of God is shining yet anew, we can ask God to show us how we are to move ahead into the year to come. We can ask God to reveal more nearly the calling all of us inherit. We can ask God's presence to come again, to stir us up once more in our world and in our lives and as a parish and show us what we are meant to do in this year ahead. And so I ask this morning for the third part of this series of features that are divinely Oscar worthy in life, I hope. That is the gospel this morning. Not these words, it's the gospel this morning. I ask God to reveal more nearly what we're called to do and where we're called to go as a congregation. And I would ask each of us to pray about that and ask for the empowerment to not only see it, but to follow it more nearly in this year ahead. And to help us do that, I decided to call upon the ultimate authority and go right to the top. <laughs> when this phone rings, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> When you pick it up and dial, anything can happen. So I'm going to push zero for the operator, because we know who the operator is. Yes, sir. I mean, yes, ma'am. <laughs> really? 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 It, it's for you. <laughs>